Okay, up next is Anson. Anson wrote in and said, When discussing political issues such as the economy and illegal immigration with leftists, I frequently get confused by the ridiculous things they say and lose my train of thought. How can I deal with these abstract statements that basically mean nothing when these discussions come up? How can I stop overcomplicating things for myself and learn to articulate the logic behind my beliefs without getting sidetracked or frustrated by all of the leftist propaganda out there? That's from Anson. All right, so Anson. Yes. Let's do the economy. Okay. I'm going to... uh... I'm going to deport conversations about immigration for the <laughs> just for a moment. Oh, new, those new are the hardest ones by far, the immigration ones. Uh, all right. Well, maybe we'll come back to it. Okay. So, first of all, who are these leftists? Are they friends, family, people on the subway, um, people in airplanes? Who are they? Uh, coworkers, um, friends, and some of them aren't even necessarily leftists. They just harbor these ridiculous ideas that are not based on facts like you know immigration like everyone deserves a second chance and you know all this and like i grew up with this like my dad like anytime you criticize him like he deflects it by saying like with these abstract statements that mean nothing like i call them isms and it's just like i get so infuriated when people do that like i can't outsmart people after that i i know i have no idea what to say and it's like okay so it's about your dad Right. The reason you're having trouble with the leftists is they use the same tactics as your dad. I mean, to be blunt, right? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Okay. I mean, okay. that's what I get out of it, at least. Right. Okay. So th- there are a couple of principles which I think are helpful in this area. I'll go over them very briefly, and, and then you can tell me if, if they match, right? Okay. So the first, of course, is the idea that society is the state. Right, and, and what this means is that people say, well, I want to help immigrants, or I want to help people, right? Mm-hmm. Everyone deserves a second chance. It's like, okay, then give it to them. But don't ask the government to do it. That's different, right? And it's Bastiat said this, you know, said, well, we, we don't want the government distributing corn. Oh, you want everyone to starve to death. It's like, you know, people can distribute corn who aren't part of the government, right? In fact, they'll do a much better job. So... When it comes to, like you say, well, I want to help. Let's say you want to help people in Mexico. Okay. Send them some money. There are tons of charities who will help people in Mexico. So the idea that if you want to help Mexicans have a better life, that doesn't mean that you need some big giant ass government program to, to drag them over and pay them welfare and this, like that. How is that? I mean, that that's not the only way to do it. And it's probably not the best way to do it. I mean, I'm speaking, you know, I know it is not, but in terms of helping lefties, right? The other thing, too, you know, one of the big problems, you know, why has the third world become such a crap hole in, in so many ways? Well, partly that's the result of immigration. Because what happens is when Western countries open their borders to immigration from the third world, who leaves first to come to the West? The countries that are not as well off as the West. Right, but who in those countries, which what uh, what type of person tends to be the first to leave when immigration opens up in the West? And I don't mean like unfettered, cross the Mediterranean on a toothpick kind of immigration. I mean legal immigration where you've got to fill out a bunch of forms, you've got to pay money, you've got to wait, you've got to navigate bureaucracy. Does it tend to be smarter people or less smart people who can do that? Through legal channels, definitely smarter people. Right. Okay. Now, the migrant thing uh, is a totally different kettle of fish. So we're just talking about the legal immigration to the West will disproportionately scoop intelligent people out of the third world and bring them to the West. Right? Right. Now, let's say (laughs) that you take 10% of the smartest people out of some third world country. Who's left? Like the ninety percent of the people that are less intelligent, the Jethros, yeah, <laughs> right, <laughs> the Beverly Hillbillies, right. So there's a giant brain drain through legal immigration. There's a giant brain drain of taking competent, intelligent people out of those countries. Now, 
in a lot of those countries, it's not like they're up to their eyeballs in brains anyway. I mean, so they, you're yeah. taking the people who might otherwise be running their social institutions. You're taking the people who might otherwise be running their governmental institutions. You're taking the people out who might otherwise have started businesses. You're taking people out who otherwise might have figured out really great medical treatments or might have found some way to convince people in Africa to stop eating bats. You're like, whatever it is, right? And so when you take people out of those countries, I get that the people who are in those countries want to come to the West because it's a lot easier to get something built at Ikea and delivered to your house than to try and build it yourself in your basement. I get that. I'd much rather get a ping pong table coming to me as a ping pong table rather than six million parts and a potential migraine, right? Right. So I get it. People want to come to the West because the West is more free and it's more civilized and it's more reasonable and it's blah, 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 right? Yeah. So I, I completely and totally understand that. However... We must understand that that guarantees a vastly reduced standard of life in the originating country. So we're helping a small number of people, and we are harming enormously a huge number of people. Oh, look, the 25,000 smartest people in Pakistan have come to the West. Oh, and then what? What happens to Pakistan? What happened, right? What happens then? So it's a disproportionately taking people who are the only chance these countries have for improvement. Let's not kid ourselves. Smart people are the only chance these countries have for improvement. We are taking the only chance the third world has to improve out of the third world and dumping it into the first world. Yeah, we're and they're not going being, back. I mean, Sorry? it's depriving the it's depriving the rest of the world of like people with you know higher IQ and like I've watched a lot of your videos on how much IQ has to do with just your success in general in life. And I mean, yeah, you are condemning you are condemning to perpetual Stone Age poverty countless countries around the world by taking the only smart people out of the country and bringing them to the West. So it's just, and then what happens is say, well, we got to put a lot of Got to put a lot of foreign aid into these third world countries because they don't seem to be doing so well. No kidding. Really. Taking all the smart people out of the third world countries, funnily enough, they're not doing that well. Well, yeah, I think you're right. Hey, funnily enough, take all the doctors and nurses out of the hospital. You don't get better. When you go there, in fact, you get sick because everyone else is coughing. They're not getting better. Come on. Like it's like it's like it's like taking all the good actors out of a movie and then wondering why the movie doesn't sell. I mean, even okay. I mean, I've done a lot of research on these topics, and I know I've done more research than the people I talk to. And it's just that in those moments where they start saying these things, okay, fine, we'll do it. Give me a role play, fine, 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 fine. I'll pretend it's a choice. No, okay, give me a role play. You be one of these lefties, and we'll we'll do immigration if you want. Okay. Um, so I would like to put a pause on immigration, whatever you say, right? Okay. And what do they say? You just pretend to be them. Well, I mean, why do you want to do that? Don't you care about the people that are trying to get into this country and have a better life? Sure. Then sure, but... Um, I also care about my family, my children, right? Because the people who are coming in are huge drains on society as a whole. Uh, I also care about their country and their future because everyone who's trying to come into this country is usually smarter than the population they're leaving behind, which means that if less intelligent people are left behind in those countries, those countries are never, ever going to get better. And, you know, as far as the migrants go, the cost of resettling someone in the Middle East is $1,000. It's almost $13,000 to resettle someone in America. So it's better for them to be in the Middle East, same culture, same language, same culture, same geography, same weather, whatever you name it, same religion. So we should help 13 people in the Middle East rather than bring one person to the West. So I, I do care about them. 
which and I, but I also I'm allowed to care about myself and my family too, right? I mean, we we have a country that is is massively in debt. You can say this for all the Western countries. We're already massively in debt. We simply can't bring endless amounts of people in who cost money out of the public treasury because we have no money. We have no money left. So what's going to happen is we're going to bring a bunch of people in. They're not going to integrate because they're on welfare, and then we're going to run out of money. And then what? Is that kind to them? Like, you got to think smarter than just the sentimentality of the moment. What about the people all left behind? They've got all the smart people have left and they can't figure out how to make their country better. What about the long-term effects of all of this? What about my family? What about the debt? It's a little bit more complicated than let's be nice to everyone. I mean, I don't know what to say after that because if some – like you're there's mean you can say you're a racist <laughs> <laughs> well yeah i'm sure yeah that would come i mean i told a girl i was a donald trump french fan uh fan and she called me a sexist so yeah i'm sure that would definitely follow what's up. wrong with being sexy no, I'm gonna... <laughs> <laughs> i mean yeah it turns into a character assassination once they realize that you've actually got some facts and you know but they're pissed off because they want to hold on to their ideas and they want to be right and they want to – No, no. They don't want to hold on. They've got no ideas. No, they don't want they, – they want to hold on to their sentimentality. And so uh, let's just say you call me a sexist or a racist or whatever, right? OK. OK. So then you could say something like this. You are a horrible human being. You are a horrible human being. Look, you brought up a topic and we started debating it. Am I saying I've got all the absolute final answers? I didn't say that. I made some arguments. Those arguments have facts, reason, and evidence behind them. Now, if you're going to sit around and turn around and just start slandering someone, that is incredibly irresponsible. It's incredibly destructive. It's incredibly disrespectful. And you know what? It's incredibly racist of you. I didn't bring race into it. So the fact that you're starting to bring race into it when I didn't mention anything about race means that you're the one who thinks in terms of race all the time, which makes you the racist because you're calling me as a white person racist when I never mentioned race at all, which means that you're judging me as a white person. Guess what? You're a racist. And if you want to have conversations with adults, if you want to have conversations where intelligent people exchange ideas for the betterment of the world, you got to come up with something a little better than, you're a racist, you're a sexist, you're a misogynist. I mean, this is not, that's not having an argument. That's not even having a tantrum. That's just a confession that you belong at the children's table, not the adult's table. Now, if you want to get some facts, and if you want to take a break and say, listen, I haven't heard these facts and arguments before. Let me go and check them out. Let me get back to you. That's perfectly fine. And maybe you'll come up with something that's going to repudiate and we'll both end up wiser and better because of it. But if you're just going to vomit up stupid, silly, negative ad homonyms, then you're just telling me that you really don't belong in any kind of adult discussion about important things. And you should stop uh, uh, trying to to pretend that you can juggle uh, when you can barely even find your face with your hands. Yeah, I recognized what you did at the what you're talking about at the end. I watched that presentation by Ben Shapiro about arguing with liberals, and um, I'm telling you, man, like my brain just freezes up in those situations. Like if I'm talking to people that are like like minded, I have no problem articulating where I'm coming from. But I mean, what is the best way to approach like these discussions? When do you like just why? Assume- why do you want to? I I guess I'm kind of freaked out about the state of things right now. Like I feel like Western. No, I I get that. I get that. But but if I don't speak Japanese and I'm freaked out about something, I don't go and talk to people who only speak Japanese because I'm not doing anything because they don't understand what I'm saying and I don't understand what they're saying. So Mike, you you probably feel like like a lot of people do. You feel helpless, right? Yeah. And you feel desperate. Well, I've got to get people to agree with me so that the world gets better. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's a good Okay, so so here's the important thing to understand, Anson. If you feel helpless, the worst thing to do is try and talk to people who reject reason and evidence. Because what's that going to make you feel even more of? More helpless. Yeah. See, this is the tactic of leftists. They invite you into a debate. And they throw reason and evidence to the wind and they manipulate and they insult and they dodge and they squirm and they do whatever, right? 
Yeah. So that you end up bewildered and helpless. <laughs> yeah. Right? There are some animals who will attack you with a tooth and claw, and there are other animals that, you know, like the Komodo dragon, just gives you a little chomp, a little nip, and then you just get weaker over time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like a, it's a venom, right? It's a kind of venom. And so there are people in your life, there are people I've met, I disagree with them significantly, but they energize me. There are people I've met I agree with significantly, and they drain me. And it's got, so it's not the particular perspective. It's the methodology. It's the engagement. It's the interest. It's the willingness to listen, to, to debate back, to get involved, to get engaged, right? To be even remotely an adult in these areas, right? Most people intellectually, Anson, are barely out of the crib. So true. You need, no, but you get, but you get that, but you don't get it. Right? Like, I get it in thought, but I definitely don't practice it. You don't get it, right? Listen. You and I are in a field. We've got catcher's mitts, well-oiled. I got my left-handed one. Yay. And like when I first came to North America. And we've got, you know, one of those big old hunking, brain-busting baseballs, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, cricket ball. Even better. Basically twine wrapped in concrete, right? <laughs> And so we've got this, you know, and you and I, we can like, sun can be going down, we can be listening to music, we can be chatting a bit, and we can be like 100 yards away from each other, throwing the balls back and forth all day, right? And it's nice. I like that, boom, you know, it's just, it's cool. I mean, I'm a Frisbee guy. I'm a throwing ball guy. I, I love that stuff. It's great, right? So you and I can be doing that because we're adults, right? Now, let's say that you have a three-month-old baby. And I say, I'm going to play catch with this brain-busting concrete cricket ball with your three-month-old baby. What are you going to say? Um, you're, it's, like, you need to rethink what you're doing. I, I hope you'd be a little bit more assertive than that. Like, no, you crazy bastard, you're going to kill him. Because you're going to throw the ball, it's going to bust his head open, right? Yeah. Because he's three months old. Kind of doesn't even, he's not even know what a catch mid is. Or a baseball glove, right? Yeah. Same thing, you know, let's prop your, I can give one out here to Mike. Let's prop your three-month-old up, and I'm going to take slap shots at the hockey net with your three-month-old baby there, right? How's that going to work out? It's not. So when you genuinely recognize that most people are still in the crib when it comes to intellect, they don't know how to debate. They don't know how to argue. They don't know how to reason. They're entirely emotion-based. Oh, come on. They've been raised by women. They've been trained in school by women. Mm -hmm. Did you get a lot of logic classes when you were a kid from women? No. You didn't, did you? Not really. A lot of famous female philosophers in the, in the logic camp? Uh, no, not that come to mind. Yeah, brand a couple hours, right? But it's it's kind of a sausage fest, right? And it's even worse now than it, than it was in the past. So, unfortunately, we have the fascism of feels, right? Well, I feel sentimental about immigrants. I care for them. Why? Because... Because I don't have any babies, right? This is another fundamental thing, too. Do people have children? Like, it's not 100%, right? Ayn Rand didn't have kids, and Coulter doesn't have kids, and, you know, they're both pretty ferocious when it comes to reason and evidence in many, many ways, right? Milo, unlikely to, well, not going to have biological kids. Maybe he'll adopt one day. But... People who, women in particular who don't have kids, I'm always suspicious about their sentimentality. I'm always suspicious about the sentimentality of women. So I've been watching this show. Spoilers! <laughs> I've been watching this show. It was recommended to me a long time ago. I never got around to watching it. Called uh, The Island with Bear Grohl, or whatever his name is, right? And basically, there are 14 men and 14 women all dropped in different islands. And they, they've got nothing. they got a couple of fish hooks and a day's supply of water. And they have to figure out how to survive. The men have to go and try and kill a crocodile. They get so hungry at some point, right? 
And on the women's island, oh, don't even get me started. But anyway, everyone, everything everyone said from the MGDAOs is true. But the women adopt these two baby pigs and name them and cuddle them and sleep with them. Oh, my. Right? And, um, <laughs> you know, at some point, they get hungry. <laughs> I can't eat something I've named. And there are a couple of sensible women who are like, don't name them. Don't name them. It's, come on. We know where they're going to end up. And um, they're very sentimental. And they're all like, so that when the men get the crocodile, they're like, gentlemen, we have handbags. Right? <laughs> like they're thrilled. They're ooga, ooga, you know, coming in now. Hey, I get baby pigs are cuter than crocodiles. But they're like, yes, we got the crocodile. Come and eat. Right. <laughs> right. And the women are all like crying because they have to kill the baby pigs to eat them. And it's like, it's not bad. It's not a men, good, women, bad thing. I mean, it's just different wiring because, you know, babies and breastfeeding and right. I mean, so the sentimentality for women is designed for their babies. And when women don't have babies, they adopt migrants. They adopt immigrants. They adopt minorities, <laughs> whatever, Right. The, the, the sentimentality. So they can exercise their sentimentality on pretend children substitutes, and they don't have any real children that are competing for those resources, right? That's fascinating. So they can virtue signal all they want. Angela Merkel, who has no children. Yeah. They can virtue signal all they want. It's not costing their children anything. And women have this instinctual desire to nurture and to protect and to give over to people who are needy. It's beautiful. It's beautiful unless there's a big state and not a lot of children around. Then you get this complacent, like insane pathological altruism where the entire planet becomes the missing children in the woman's lonely ass, ancient cat feeding family portraits of nothingness. So it's really, really important to understand what you're dealing with here. When you talk, I to a lot of, I think, really think this is true. I can't prove it. I understand. It's just a way of looking at things. I think it's true. When you talk to a lot of women and you talk about putting the border up, what they hear is, I'm not going to let you see your children. That's how no. it registers to them? I really believe it does. What if they really, I'm not saying consciously. But if, if groups have become child substitutes for women, then it's really a different emotional experience. Hmm. Right? Like, so, I mean, we all know what it is with women and cats, right? Yeah. I mean, they dress them up. They feed them gourmet stuff. They give them names. They project weird, meaningless personalities. Oh, he's feeling mischievous. No, he's a cat. Can't even recognize something in a mirror. Ah, bemused resignation is emanating from my cat. No, furry projection is bouncing back your craziness from your cat. <laughs> and we all know what it's like with women and the cats. If they're single, if they don't have children, all of that maternal energy, all of that investment, like women are designed to have like eight or 10 children, children, real human beings who grow and do stuff other than hopefully don't pee on your couch, right? And the hope that so this massive amount of sentimentality that women have, which is designed to help them nurture an endless wave of helpless dependent infants and bring them to adulthood. I mean, look at Phyllis Schlafly, mother of the year, six kids. She's fine without migrants. Because the reason why women who don't have kids but who have kids substitutes never grow up. Because their child substitutes never grow up. Like, if you get cats and they become your pretend kids, 
they're never growing up, which means you never have to escape the early infancy part of motherhood. Which means you can remain ridiculously sentimental and kuchikui and brain dead. And listen, I've, I've been around babies. They're, you know, they're wonderful. But you, you know, every phase that you, with a kid, it's like, wow, this phase is great. Man, I can't wait for this phase to end. <laughs> you know, and the next phase comes, wow, this phase is great. And you like it for a while. And then you're like, wow, I'm really looking forward to this phase ending and all that, right? But with, when there's child substitutes rather than children, the women never have to grow up to match the accomplishments and growth and maturation of their children. Which is why the old cat ladies are so retarded in so many ways, because they, the, the cats have never grown up. They've never achieved independence. They're not exactly filling out college applications for Chairman Meow, right? Yeah. So it's important to understand at what primal level you are dealing with with a lot of people. The women's desire to nurture is very powerful. And it also doesn't help when you have mother-headed or single mom households with all of this stuff because it's the dad's job to step into the sentimentality and pry it off the kid. Nah, she'll be fine. She can jump from the top step. Oh, she'll be fine. She doesn't need training wheels anymore. Oh, she'll be fine. If she falls, she'll learn. She'll get up, right? I mean, I don't know. I mean, most moms wouldn't let their kids learn how to ride a bike if they weren't in full plate armor. Whereas, you know, when I was learning how to ride a bike, I was like strawberry elbows, strawberry knees. Those were like weeks. I'm fine, right? And so when you have a lot of, because, you know, say we're women, but a lot of men now too, but they're all raised with this hyper-caution, bubble wrap the kids fear women have. Women in the absence of men turn paranoid and hyper-sentimental. And lose their bearings. Listen, bad things happen to men in the absence of women as well. But we're just talking about this other thing. Like women in the absence of men go crazy. Oh, I've seen it. <laughs> right? And we're seeing it as a society. This crazy, no in-group preference, no borders, no, like everything's sentimental. Everything's emotional driven. It's the next five minutes. That's because there's nobody around saying, stop it. Stop it. You chose not to have children. I'm not going to pretend there's imaginary children out there for you to avoid the pain and the loss of not having children. Right? If you choose not to have children, that's fine. That's fine. But then don't take the bullshit substitute kids route. Because that is incredibly destructive because the migrants aren't your children. The cats aren't your children. The immigrants aren't your children. The poor people aren't your children. So this is the level that you're dealing with, that people at an emotional level have made these crazy associations facilitated by the state, right? When women don't have men around and they have kids and they have bills, they run to the government in general. So the government has become the husband. But without all of those annoying equality demands, right? He's become the sugar daddy where you don't even have to get a boob job. And so when women don't even have kids and don't have a husband, then other things become their kids. Because like that's, let me tell you, so other things become the kids, the governments have to pay virtue signaling, blah, 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 right? But let me tell you something about middle-aged women who are ridiculously unhappy these days, like crazy unhappy. So middle-aged woman, life gives you significant sorrow and mortality in the reality of aging parents, right? So the way that life is supposed to work is... You push your children into adulthood and you lower your parents into the grave. That's how life is supposed to work. You know, 25-year, 30-year generations, right? Uh -huh. So your, your, your kids grow into adulthood. And as they grow into adulthood, oftentimes your parents are in declining health. And we're talking like I know we the crypt keepers live forever now. But it's biologically in general. 
And the the happiness of seeing your children go out into the world as adults and get married and have kids and the happiness that you feel, it's the bittersweetness. You feel happiness about that, but a lot of times at the same time, and if you're lucky, your kids are healthy, your parents are healthy, but a lot of times as your kids are going out into the world, getting married, having their own kids, your own parents are aging. And that's the bittersweet cycle of life that we all, a lot of us have to recognize and, and deal with. Ah, but my friend, if you are a woman who's not had children and you're close to your parents, then what happens is you you come into middle age. You are lowering your parents into the grave, but not shepherding any children into adulthood. Could you imagine how depressing that is? There's no new life. You're burying the old life. And you will follow, and you've not used the gift of your existence to bring anyone into existence. And you're trailing after your parents down the soft steps to an ashy grave to nothingness. Because when you don't have children, and you don't do something important in the world, right? Most people, they're not out there writing best-selling books or having giant YouTube channels or influencing whatever, whatever, right? But if you don't have children, almost everything that you are in general will vanish and be forgotten. When you don't have children, all the photos you take with your cell phone will never be looked at again after you're dead. All the pictures, the boxes of pictures, the accumulated pictures and photos, and, and you, oh, you saved that receipt from that movie, and you saved that receipt from that play, and you, you saved that little piece of lace that you were working on once, and one day we're going to finish. If you don't have any kids, you know, deep down in your heart, you bury your parents, okay, you'll look at their pictures for a while, and you're going to get old, and you got these hard drives and and flash drives full of photos, all the things you did. And you know when you get older and when you you die, first of all, who's going to be there when you go through the process of sinking into death? And secondly, think of all the photos, all the photos you've took. Nobody will ever look at them again. Now, if you have children... People will remember you. You will have had you will have an you will have had an effect future into into the future pretty much forever. Yeah, it's a butterfly effect. You have produced children, you have had a massive influence on them. That's going to influence their kids, it's going to influence everyone they meet. You create this wonderful ripple out into the future forever. You don't have kids. You are a spear dropped from an ancient height, vanishes into the pond, barely a ripple, boink. And you're done. So, childless women and childless men want their societies to continue. They didn't bother themselves to have any children. So they advocate for immigrants. So that some bodies can be in their houses after they're dead so that they think that they're contributing something to the continuation of their society. They're not, I think, in many ways. But they didn't have children. They want their tribe to continue. So they want to import what they did not grow. And if that's not allowed, it creates a deep and existential pain in the heart of childless people. Because they know they haven't fundamentally contributed to the continuance of their tribe. They know that no one will remember them. They know that their photos will end up reformatted. You know, all this work to create and accumulate thousands of photos. Format, boom, gone. Somebody else will use that hard drive to store photos that will actually be looked at at some point in the future. And it would be interesting to me if there were a study done which measured 
whether people who have who are happily married who have more kids how they feel about immigration versus the people who have no kids or who are single or unhappily married or whether people who tried to have kids but couldn't feel the same about immigration of people who chose not to have kids. We all need to contribute to our tribe. Because if we don't, there's no tribe. Now, some people can contribute to the tribe through having children. Some people can contribute to the tribe by great works by inspiration, by storytelling, by songs, by improvements, by technology, by hiring people. But everyone deep down knows that they have to contribute to the tribe somehow. Or they're just kind of hangers on, they're getting by, they'll be forgotten. And it's not something I think a lot of people think about when they're younger, but middle age and afterwards, you, you, you start to think about your legacy. You do. How can I contribute to the tribe? I can help the poor. Ah, but if I actually have to help the poor, that's quite a bit of work. So what I can do is I can vote for someone who's going to help the poor. Now, it's true, my taxes will go up, but of course a lot of women work for the government, so (laughs) they're fine with taxes going up. There's more money for them. But it's true, my taxes will go up. But I don't have to do anything. It's easy legacy. It's lazy legacy. It's not a legacy. It's kind of a curse. I'm going to advocate for good things that other people will do. That's the virtue signaling. I'm going to contribute to my tribe without actually having to go out and do anything and without having to get up early, change diapers, and raise children. My contribution is going to be empty words and child substitution, and weird, vague, emotional offense should you question the actual contribution to the tribe that I'm imagining. So when you start to take away government programs from people, when you start to question their moral validity, this is what people have founded their sense of value and purpose and worth and contribution. This is what they have done with their lives if they've advocated for this stuff And it is bound into their very sense of providing value to the world. I can get rid of government programs from a moral standpoint. Intellectually, I make that case. Because I know that they're interfering with actually doing good in the world. I've done so much good in the world. I have no need for any governmental substitutes. I am a father. So I never wake up and say, gee, I wonder if I've contributed to my tribe or the world. The tribe is not ethnic. Rational people, right? I don't ever wonder about the value of what I am doing with my life. Doesn't mean it can't be better. Just saying, I never sit there and say, boy, I wish I'd done something with my gifts. Boy, that wouldn't that have been great. No, that's not an issue for me. So I don't need virtue signaling because I actually have virtue. I don't need other people to do stuff because I'm actually doing stuff. I don't need any child substitutes. I have a child. I don't need virtue signaling because I have virtue and I'm acting on it. I don't need to pretend. I don't need for other people to think I'm good because I'm doing good, actually doing good. So when you talk to, oh, let's close the borders. You're taking away people's foundational sense of what they're contributing to the tribe. And for most people in those situations, for a lot of people in those situations, it's too late for them to actually contribute to the tribe. You're taking away their drug of choice. Smug, virtuous, self-congratulation. I believe, is the most powerful drug. Because the people who suffer usually suffer long after you're dead. It's really hard to quit heroin when you don't think anyone will suffer. And even if people will suffer, they'll suffer after you're dead, when the national debt comes due. 
So the reason why people lash out at you when you start taking away their moral signaling, their contribution to the tribe, because when you say well, the welfare state is bad, they think the welfare state is good and that their advocacy of the welfare state is their contribution to the virtue, to tribe, to memory, to history, to everything. You take that away from people? Ooh, it's a Mike Tyson blow to the solar plexus. Boom. You thought you were contributing. You were corrupting. You thought you were doing good. You were doing harm. You thought you were helping people. You were harming people. You thought you were contributing to the tribe. You were destroying the tribe. Wow. You gave up kids because you thought you could do good with all this crap. Now you don't have the kids and the good you thought you were doing, which made it okay to not have kids, turns out to be evil. Oops. Bad scene. This is why people fight so ferociously. Every good that we're doing displaces other goods we could be doing. If I've spent my life virtue signaling and oh, open the borders and more welfare and free education for everyone and blah, 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 right? Well, because I've done all of that crap, I haven't done a whole bunch of other stuff. So if that crap turns out to be good, there's no backup for me. If that, that stuff turns out to be bad, there's no backup for me. You are taking away people's sense of value and contribution. And you're not just taking it away, you're reversing it. You're saying to them, the good that justifies your existence and helps you live with the fact that you didn't have kids and didn't do anything of direct and immediate virtue with your life, all the things that make you feel like you're a good person were deceptively implanted in you by power mongers who were using you as useful idiots to grow the state and destroy the future and kill the tribe. And you have no kids, and your parents are dying, and no one will ever look at your photos in the future. Does that help? Oh, yeah, that's, that's some pretty mind-blowing stuff. Like, it makes... It helps me understand why people lash out the way they do because you're – it's like their whole sense of self-worth is based on, you know, this bastardized sense of compassion. And, like, their parental instincts are, like, you know, projected onto, like, the immigrants and, you know, the poor and everything. And when you – And the blacks for a lot of people too or other minorities. Yeah, minorities. And if you try to, like, set them straight, you know, and – dispense some logic like it's you know they can't, they can't take it they feel like they're dying I guess they do and this annihilation panic is what happens when people's core moral beliefs are challenged it is a form of annihilation panic because remember our brains are so ad adept and I've talked about this in the gene wars presentations our brains are so advanced and adept with concepts that a lot of morality a lot of concepts are using us to reproduce themselves jumps from place to place like a cold like a an illness mm -hmm. and collectivism socialism state power pathological altruism these are viruses within our mind that are attempting to replicate. Definitely agree now, with that. any animal, any animal that is faced with the end of its gene pool will react with unbelievable levels of ferocity. Collectivism is a virus that uses people to spread. And if you challenge that, collectivism triggers huge levels of rage in the same way a cornered rat will attack a bear. It's the end of the meme. It's the end of the concept if it's challenged and overthrown. So it triggers fight or flight in the host, the parasite of collectivism, the idea of collectivism. Triggers a fight or flight in the host brain. 
to warn you off from trying to challenge its replication. And so once there has been an unconscious identification with any particular group as children, well, you're coming between a mama grizzly and her cub. And what does the mama grizzly do? Attacks. And how? Like, they'll fight to the death. Yep. Yeah. And it turns out you can't fight a grizzly with graphs. <laughs> yeah, it's fact. Like, yeah. Or reasoned arguments. Right? Yeah. It's, it's a cool. very primitive response to a meme or gene threatening conversation. Your children, like the people who don't have kids. They don't know what it's like to be worshipped. I mean, if you're a good parent, your child will worship you. Now, it's hard. You, you can't get that anywhere else. That's a singular drug. Yeah. Now, to be worshipped is is something that women in particular crave because if they didn't crave it, they would be bad moms, right? You want to be worshipped by your kid. You want to make your kid happy. You want to, your kid to light up when you come in the room. You want your kid to laugh when you make a joke. Like you want you you tickle you you, you make your kid happy, right? You want to be worshipped. So women. Deep down, I believe this. I can't prove it. I'm just telling as a theory. Women deep down think the migrants will worship them the way kids should. Be so grateful. I love them. Love them. Thank you. Thank you for letting me into your country. Thank you for saving me from the hellhole I came from. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. We love you. What did women hold out for the migrants? Candy. Candy which is what you give to children. So they'll be loved and people will be grateful and they'll feel maternal. And that they have value and they have continued the tribe and they have raised people by importing people. Instead of raising children to adulthood, they import people and turn them loose on society. Wow. I mean, I've watched the presentations on the RNK selected, and is is that like a way of just quantifying someone's behavior and like thought process, or is that like a real biological hardwiring that some people have? I believe it's a real biological heart wiring that seeks to reproduce itself. The, the R selection strategy seeks to alienate fathers from the family, seems to create, seeks to create a matriarchy, and seeks to create an environment with seemingly infinite resources so it can replicate. That's its Petri dish. That's what it feeds on. Meat eaters eat meat, and the uh, vegetarians eat, eat uh, plant food, oh vegetables. Right? So that, that's the nutrition. The nutrition for the R selected is father absence, seemingly influent, uh, infinite resources, no in-group preference. That's what, so that's the welfare state, right? Get the, kid, get the dads away, create seemingly infinite resources. That's what's going to recreate. That, that what most feeds the R selection gene set, whereas K selection gene set, we talked about father absence, uh, father presence, limited resources, high in-group preference, great investment in children, and so on, right? And what's always kept that at bay is the fact that children take a lot of resources. But with the welfare state, children now become a source of revenue rather than a cost, which is the ultimate R-selected steroid. Yeah. And um, the, the, the maternal instinct, the, the, the desire to have children, children take such an enormous amount of sacrifice. They, they, they really, I mean, it's incredible. And I, I won, right? I mean, you get eight kids. I mean, you, that's, your life is just being a mom. That's it. And that's going to be the case from, you know, biologically, from historically, when you're 14 to when you're 45. It's 30 years. That's most of your life when you're young. That's what women are designed for. Take kids out of the equation. It 
it's a little, we got to wonder, you know, say, oh, well, there's a power vacuum, right? Well, there's a child vacuum in the heart of women. What rushes in to fill the hearts of women in the absence of children? What decisions do women make if they choose not to have children or make stupid life decisions and end up not having children? What rushes in to fill? Well, projection, sentimentality, and the creation of entire classes of child substitutes. Which is why it's as tough to get women to understand that the refugees could be a problem in the same way that it's tough to get a mom to understand that her kid might be a bit of a brat. That's my child you're talking about. My child is wonderful. My child is the smartest. My child is the best. My Whatever, right? I mean, they can't see reason. Yeah. Because they're not seeing people. They're seeing kids. So what... Like, you're definitely doing, you know, you're going above and beyond, like, you know, with, you know, creating the Free Domain, you know, radio show and, like, you know, your videos on YouTube and everything, you know, you're enlightening people everywhere. Like, what is, um, what are, what are, like, what am I supposed to do? Like, what, how am I supposed to proceed through life with all these people, like, ruining the world around me? Like, how am I supposed to deal with that? Well, did you, how big was the truth pill you just had to swallow? Um, like in I mean, this conversation it, I mean it went down pretty easy but it's pretty big right oh for sure okay so let that digest before you try and leap into action because everyone wow big truth bomb it's like okay now what do I do it's like well how about you digest right just mull this stuff over right okay. I, I mean I, I first of all I can't tell you what to do because the whole point is to uh, it's for you to find motivation within yourself let's say I said well go and do an X right well if it's not organic or genetic it's not organic within you it's not going to be sustainable well, i was so just mean, absorb and, and process and mull things over have more of these conversations test this theory maybe it's true maybe it's not maybe there's other things call back if you've got more information but this what should i do stuff mm-mm, mm-mm, mm-mm. don't give me that don't okay. give me that nobody told me nobody told me and i'm not going to tell you okay I didn't mean it like it at like a super specific way, like, like, but I get what you're saying though. Yeah. All right. Will you give it a try? Just, you know, have these conversations and just notice people and see if they, you know, do they have kids? Do they want them, right? Oh yeah. When you were talking to me about that and I thought back to the people I talked to, like the, the first three examples that popped in my head are um, women and they don't have, they're like in their mid to late 20s and they don't have kids. Right. So right. the empirical. So already they're there. not going to have a lot of kids, right? Yeah. Right. So yeah, just something to, something to mull over. What do you contribute to your tribe if you don't even have children and you don't do big virtuous things in society? But again, people can choose not to have kids. Again, I want to say, you got to have kids. I mean, I think people, it's good to have kids. I think it's great. We're all alive because someone made that choice. So it's kind of tough to wriggle out of that basic reality. But um, what do you do if you want to contribute to the tribe, but you're really, really lazy? You vote Democrat. You pick a substitute and you virtue signal. And then you get really, really ferocious with anyone who tries to take away that bullshit drug from you, right? Yeah. All right. I'm going to move on to the next caller, but I really, really appreciate the – the question. I mean, I think it produced some stuff that I think will be very helpful to people. And listen, let, let us know. You know, this is a hypothesis, right? I mean, this is not like, I don't have any ironclad studies on this, but, you know, people can let me know in the comments below, in the video, whatever, but just, you know, let us know what you think. Put out the experiment and we'll see if we can gather some data, even though it will still largely be anecdotal. Better than nothing, right? Yeah. Um, th- thank you so much for taking the time, like you, for, you know, explaining all this to me, like, you know, I definitely got a lot out of this. And um, Great, Anson. Well, I appreciate you calling in. All right. Who's up next?